Okay, this month we will be looking at serialization and in the past few months we've added uh, we've looked at adding a REST API to an existing little toy database of comic books. We did it with two different uh, networking frameworks and in both cases we needed to serialize our application class instances to and from JSON in order to communicate the representation of the class instances as JSON data over the REST API. And prior to this, we had looked at um, you know other networking scenarios where we were writing you know a network client for the NNTP protocol, and the NNTP protocol has a way that it serializes uh, instances of data structures and other data as defined in the protocol. So. And that's a, a bespoke one-off text representation. It's very similar to the way that, in terms of NNTP, that is. And it's very similar to the way SMTP encodes data, the simple mail transfer protocol. But when you are uh, doing serialization of your own instances, you're not driven by those requirements. And I'm not sharing my screen, so let's make sure I'm doing that. And serialization extends beyond networking, although it is a common use case for serialization. For instance, you may need to serialize um, information that, you know, maybe you're storing it in a database. Maybe you're not storing it in a database. Maybe it's just an in-memory data structure and you need to checkpoint that onto some kind of storage medium at periodic intervals so that if the program crashes you can restore its in-memory state from a checkpoint and continue from there to avoid losing uh, work that was in progress. I mean it's nice to have a program that runs and does some work and exits cleanly but for a long-running program it may be the case that uh, you, you can't control all of the externalities that happen when your program is running for hours, days, or weeks at a time. I mean, the power grid can go out, and you, yeah, you may have a battery backup, but it's only going to last for a certain amount of time. So, um, serialization applies to a lot more scenarios than just network communication, but network communication is a very common one. So, boost serialization is a 20-year-old library. It was literally the first release of the serialization library was submitted for inclusion in Boost in 2002. So that's 20 years ago. It's a very stable library. It's not getting um, any changes added to it at this point. It's, it's feature complete. It's very extensible. So should you need to do um, your own custom archive format, that is certainly possible. Um, and we will see how uh, we glue in the serialization library to our own data types in our application. So the design goals for boost serialization were code portability. It should only depend on standard C++ facilities, so it doesn't depend on um, custom metadata or any kind of um, other magical, you know, comment strings associated in your class or things like that in order to identify how to serialize your class instances. Uh, in a language like C Sharp or Java where you have runtime reflection facilities, those languages can drive a serialization framework simply from metadata annotations on your your class methods, your class field members, your data field members, and your class names. But we don't have that in C++. There's some proposals in the works for the idea of a compile time uh, reflection facility for C++, but that is still just an idea that is being bounced around. It's not something that we have available to us, so we have to worry about, you know, a serialization system that works with standard C++. Another goal was code economy, that they wanted it to be simple and to, to write serialization and deserialization code 
and it shouldn't require you to, you know, write a lot of boilerplate, a lot of complex things. It should be simple, easy to write, and it should be short. The amount of work to write a serializer should be proportional to the amount of things in a class instance that you need to serialize. Um, in the, another goal is independent versioning for each class definition. So that means if I have two related classes and one of them gets a new member field, then I should only have to change the serialization for the one that changed, even though the other class is coupled to it, say, if it's, you know, your typical kind of, you know, employee database, you know, if I, if I add a new record to the employee structure, it shouldn't require changes to any scheduling classes that are associated with the employee. So the individual classes can have their own version number that can um, evolve independently. And that means that uh, you have the ability to provide uh, upgrade scenarios when reading older versions of serialized data into a newer version of a class. Now, that, that is uh, considered backwards compatibility. You know, feature compatibility, well, I can't, I can't make the old code understand the new version. So it's kind of a one-way migration. Um, another goal is uh, deep pointer save and restore. So that means that if I have a class that holds a data member and that data member is a pointer to an instance of another class, then it should be easy to serialize the containing member and have the contained member serialized as well just by having the appropriate registration performed for serializers on the various types involved. Uh, and this works for not just pointers but also for references and it also works for uh, smart pointers. Uh, yes, Daryl, you have a question. I'm, I'm not sure what you mean. You mean like what happens if the pointer is null? You mean, you mean kind of like stood optional? Right. Um, he has support for stood optional in there, so there's some way of um, th there's some way of saying you know this data is present or not, and if it is, here's the data. Uh, for a pointer that is null. I didn't try that in my use case. Um, in, in my example, when we see my little example, I've updated my little comic book database to serialize and do a version upgrade, and I'm using uh, smart pointers in the version upgrade. But in my case, the smart pointers always point to something. So I, I didn't try that. But I, I'm sure he has a mechanism for handling it because this library is very complete and um, like I said, it's been around for 20 years, so I, you, you know, definitely the null pointer scenario has been considered a um, long time ago. Uh, I, I didn't see anything specific in the documentation on that, but we might discover it as we uh, review this one more time. Um, so, uh, proper restoration of pointers to shared data. So, in this case, so if it's a shared pointer, that means there's really one instance of the data that is shared between other instances of classes and every time that shared data is serialized we don't want it to reserialize reserialize another copy of the data we want it to reserialize it or to serialize that shared data once and then every other time it is subsequently requested to be serialized by subsequent instances of the referencing classes it should just recognize oh I've already serialized that shared data and I don't need to do that again and similarly on deserialization shared data should be you know kind of hydrated if you will once and then the corresponding classes that reference the shared data should just get another reference count on the data that is shared 
So uh, as long as you don't have cycles, then it, it should be good. It might. I didn't see anything explicitly here in the documentation about cycles, but it may actually recognize cycles and and not, you know, infinitely try to record. It may just say, "Oh, I've already serialized that." Uh, it has support for serialization of SDL containers and other commonly used templates. Uh, I mentioned it has support for std optional. I believe it also has support for std variant. Um, and we will see an example of using an SDL container when we go and look at my sample code here. Um, another goal is data portability so that streams of bytes created on one platform should be readable on any other. Now there's one archive format that he supports that doesn't necessarily work portably and that is the binary format because he doesn't record the endianness of the binary data that is written so as long as the machine architectures are compatible then you can uh, write it on one platform and read it on another in the binary format but the other archive formats he supports directly are a text format and an XML format and those being text formats um, the data is completely portable from one platform to another and if you've got um, Unicode strings then there is a wide character version of both of those text-based formats that uh, will encode the strings in UTF-8 so um, even for wide character strings it should be portable between platforms um, another interesting design call here is orthogonal specification of the class serialization and the archive format what this means is I write the serializer for my class and it's actually templated on the archive type so as long as the archive type that is supplied is consistent with the archive concepts that are outlined in this library then that serializer will work with any of them so it means I write my serialization code once and then I can serialize to plain text I can serialize to XML or I can serialize to a binary format and I don't have to write new code to support those other archive formats um, another design goal is non-intrusive so this means I should be able to write serializers for classes that I can't modify and this is particularly important if you need to serialize classes that come from third-party libraries for which you may not even have the source code so you can't extend those class definitions you can't add member functions uh, you, you may not even be able to add functions in the same namespace as uh, those third-party classes so uh, we'll see an example of this all, all the uh, serialization and deserialization code that I've written in my little example code here is outside of the uh, class declarations and definitions for my little comic book database and I, I did that in my example because I wanted to show how to do that it's the more complicated um, variant of adding serialization and deserialization um, it, it can certainly there's nothing wrong with adding member functions to support serialization in your classes it does mean that your classes are now coupled to the serialization library which you may not want from a design perspective uh, me I like to keep the serialization and the um, business logic of my classes I like to keep those separated and not tightly coupled um, obviously you can't write a serializer f without be for a class without being coupled to the class but I don't want my business logic connected to serialization um, and another goal is that the the archive interface itself must be simple enough so that you can create new types of archives without having to write lots of um, you know complicated code and that the archive interface itself must be rich enough that um, when you create serialized data in XML that it's actually uh, feasible to do this and it's and you know the XML is reasonable um, so 
let's take a look at his little tutorial. Now, he has uh, one, let's make this a little bigger here. He does have an interesting choice uh, for use of the ampersand operator. Uh, yes, Daryl. Are you not seeing my screen? Yay. How about now? Ah, oh, the joys of Jitsi. You get what you pay for. Can you see it now? Okay. Um, so as I was saying, uh, he um, has used the insertion operator and the extraction operator, as you might expect for inserting and extracting from an archive. But he also has used operator ampersand, which normally is either you think of it as you know bitwise and and the reason that he's done this is so that suppose your serialization function which writes data to an archive and your deserialization function which reads data from an archive are essentially identical but the only thing that's different is in one case you're doing stream insertion style operator and in the other case you're doing stream extraction style operator well, by overloading the same operator for both input and output archives, it lets you write the serialization function once and have it the code essentially be reused for both reading and writing data. Whereas if you if you use the specific operator, then you can't do that, right? The because you can't insert into an output archive and you can't extract from Sorry, I said that backwards. You can't insert into an input archive and you can't extract from an output archive. So let's take a look at his really simple case. In this case, he's using a member function. This is a class that holds a GPS position. It has two int members and a float member. And his templatized serialize function so it's templatized on the archive type so this will work for any archive type that models the archive class or the archive concept properly it takes a version that's the version of the um, it's the version of the class not the version of the archive so this class you know it's got it is at some set of fields that need to be archived you know version one perhaps and there's no accessing of the version field here because um, you know for the simple example versioning isn't needed but we need to have it in the function signature so by using this uh, ampersand operator he's able to write a single function that will serve to both serialize an instance of this class and deserialize an instance of this class and this friend declaration up here is what gives the serialization infrastructure access to this serialized function that we've written because this serialized function that we've written is private and that's good because it means people can't um, try to serialize and deserialize instances of this class outside of our um, application you know so clients can't you know serialization and deserialization is our responsibility it's not the responsibility of clients of this class so it's an it's an implementation detail that's hidden inside this class so um, that's the mechanism that's uh, that's all the glue that's required for serializing these three data members and uh, in the little main function here he's creating an output file stream it's creating an instance of that class 
then he's creating a text output archive associated with that output file stream writing the instance to the archive and then when we go out of scope here this archive will flush and close um, the archive itself the file is still open but the archive is now closed so then he can create an input file stream and create an input archive from that file stream and then read or deserialize a GPS instance out of that archive and he doesn't have an assert or anything in here but basically the, the this new GPS position that we got is it will be identical to the one that was written out earlier now this is the um, variety where we have written the serialization as a member function yes Daryl well it's it's only as um, good as the you know floating point representation I mean in terms of a float it's using IO streams underneath but um, as you know when you convert a float into a text representation you know not all floating point values can be represented you know with equal precision so the, there's just the limitation of the text representation of a float itself but as far as I'm aware there's not any um, there's not any limitation beyond that so it should come back it should make a in my test code I was only only using an int but it, it should round trip with no more error than you would get by you know printing out a float to full precision as text and then reading it back in with standard IO strings um, I didn't see anything in here about specifying the precision of a float or a double but that's an interesting yeah you, know, you may want to you know control the precision yourself I would expect that what you would do in that case is you would you know explicitly truncate any part of the precision that you wanted to ignore before you wrote it into the archive and then you would just read it back normally um, okay so that was the version with uh, a member function if you want to do it without a member function um, we'll see that there's some argument dependent lookup about how the serialization function is found but the recommendation is to put them in the namespace boost serialization um, that is the first place it will look um, so you again it's a template function template templatized on the archive type it has the same signature as we saw before except now there's a an instance of the class being passed in and you're just writing or reading using the operator ampersand uh, the data members or you could be calling getter functions since this is now a function that is not uh, doesn't have friend access I mean you could make it a friend if it had to be um, but uh, it's just in this case you know it's a it's basically a public struct so you're just accessing the fields directly but you could be calling getters um, and setters now obviously for this expression to work for both input and output it can't be calling a getter here but we'll see there's a way to split this into a load and save version if you have getter and setter functions that you have to call uh, in this case it's a simple struct so reading and writing to the struct member can work with the same syntax for both and <clears throat> as you build up your class hierarchy you have you know in this case they've got a bus stop that holds instances of a GPS position now having written serialization for a GPS position we can build on that to serialize a bus stop just by serializing the two 
data members and since there's serialization code associated with the GPS position type that will that all works as expected um, it can work further with a class hierarchy and in this case when you have a uh, so we here we have a class where we've got simple data members by um, you know has a relationship here we've got two classes related by an is a relationship so a bus stop corner is a bus stop and that means when we serialize the derived class we have to serialize the base class so in this case there's a, a specific template member function that you call to serialize your base class and then you serialize the extra information that's in the derived class um, Everything works as expected with pointers. Here, in this case, we have a class, a bus route, that has an, a, a fixed C style array of raw pointers to bus stop. And the templated member function just serializes the uh, 10 uh, pointers as it goes. This implies, uh, in reference to your question earlier, Daryl, this implies that if these were null, it has a mechanism for serializing a null pointer and recognizing that and when you deserialize it you get back the null pointer that you serialized my guess is that uh, the text file format instead of um, having the inline data for an instance of the pointed to class that it has some flag indicating it, it's a null pointer um, there's also an overload for of this operator ampersand for uh, fixed size C style arrays. You can just you can just archive the whole array instead of having to loop over the individual members. But more commonly, I think you're going to have STL data structures, and there's a header provide <coughs> excuse me a header provided for each of the main container types. And that header gives you uh, a serialization support for those data types. So you don't have to walk over the members in the container, or the elements, rather, in the container. You can just serialize the entire container. Um, now, versioning. Versioning gets interesting <coughs> because, as I say, you may add or remove fields from your class instances and you need to be able to support reading and writing the um, we well need to support reading the old version and writing the new version I mean I guess it's conceivable you may have some kind of compatibility flag that says I'm gonna continue to write out the old version but I think it's more likely that you just migrate old versions to the current version um, and in this example here they've added the driver name field as well as the array to the uh, bus route so it includes the name of the driver that drives this route and the array of stops but if it's the old version that we're being asked to read or write we don't want to write the name because that's in the new version so we only in this example, all the versions, uh, everything starts at version 0, if you don't specify what version it is. So we, in this case, they're saying if the version is greater than 0, so it's the new one, then we have the driver name field. And uh, we're going to either read or write that. And here they're declaring with this macro that the bus route class is at version 1. So when the serialized function is invoked and it's um, being asked to read or write code in this new version this this version parameter will be one and then we will do this test and then we will read and write that field now he hasn't um, stated it explicitly yet but it's very important that the order of the fields that you're reading and writing always be consistent uh, it, I mean in this case so far we've looked at 
these templatized serialized functions that do both the duty of reading and writing so there's no way that the reading and the writing can get out of sync but when you have split functions which we're going to look at next you obviously have to make sure that the reader is reading the same fields in the same order as are written by the writer because otherwise you're going to be reading data from the wrong place and sticking it into the wrong fields you know that's what would happen if the types were the same if the types of the fields are different then you get a runtime error saying you tried to read a string but the data stored in the archive was an int or something like that so here uh, again this is still the member function style we've split the read and write operations into a save and a load function and there's a little macro here that deploys the necessary machinery inside this class so that the serialization framework can recognize that this class has a reader function and a writer function now the uh, the writer function is a const member function and obviously the reader function can't be const because it's going to modify data members now he's done it here in such a way that when you're saving the the it's always the latest version when you're saving so the driver name is always saved and when we're loading we're gonna manipulate the driver name field if the version is one that supports the driver name field um, there's a bunch of examples included with this library but I think it what would be more instructive now is if we go and look at the little example that I've created and here I've got so if you if we've uh, if you're familiar with the past couple of months when we've been looking at this little comic book database here's my version one comic structure so it holds the information about a particular issue of a particular title of a comic book the credits that are associated with that and my database is simply a vector of those structs now what I've done in version 2 of my um, little database here is that I decided you know when I'm serializing these things out the same um, person name associated with the credits the person who writes the script or does the penciling or does the inking or does the lettering or does the coloring it's those names are going to be repeated over and over and over again for different issues of different comic books so rather than serializing those over and over and over again and storing them in memory over and over and over again making multiple copies of the same data we're going to have a unique association for each uh, unique name will be associated with, in, with an instance of this person structure and uh, we're gonna reference those as shared pointers so that different instances of the version 2 comic all have shared pointers to the people that are credited for working on that issue and I've written a little upgrade function that upgrades a version 1 comic to a version 2 comic and um, I've written if we just take a look at I think the upgrade function it's probably easiest if I just go this way go here and then F12 so um, upgrading from a version 1 to a version 2 I've got my upgraded comic instance and I'm just copying over the title and the issue number and just to be extra sneaky the little sentinel for a deleted issue in my database is minus one for the version one comic but in the version two comic it's minus two so I have to little do a little mapping there I have to map over the version one deleted issue sentinel to the version two deleted issue sentinel or just copy over the number and then for each of the old credits I'm gonna do a fine person that's gonna turn it into a, a shared pointer to a person structure and this is just a little map 
of string to shared pointer of person. So I do a find. And if we didn't find it, then we will emplace one to stick it in the map. Oops. We will emplace one to stick it in the map. And uh, now the iterator, whether if it found it, it points to the one that we found. And if it couldn't find one, the iterator now points to the one that we just emplaced into the map. So we can always return uh, the second of the pair to get the appropriate person pointer for the name that we were given. So this little upgrade function turns these uh, repeated strings now into shared pointers so that the strings are not repeated, they exist only once. And they're stuck in this little um, static map and um, that's kind of acting as like a little database of persons uh, for the given names. So if we um, take a look at our serialization code here, let's look at just the version one stuff first. Okay, so I wrote uh, something that would serialize the version one stuff and then serialize the version two stuff. Uh, to serialize the version 1 stuff, I'm going to create an output file stream. I'm going to associate that with an output text archive. So this is a text O archive for output. I'm going to scribble my database in there. And remember, my database is just a std vector of uh, comic instances. So I've included the vector support. I've included the header to give me uh, split functions for save and load. I'm using uh, a text O archive and a text I archive. I'm going to do input and output on archives. Uh, and I'm using the version support. And I'm saying that the version 1 comic instance has a version of 1 associated with it and the version 2 comic instance structure has a version of 2 associated with it and for the version 2 I'm gonna do split functions to read and write whereas uh, with the version 1 I'm gonna do it all with a single serialized function so here's the serializer for version 1 you know there's no shared pointers here. We don't have to do anything magical, really. We're just going to write out all the fields. And when we, um, so this serialize function that I've written in the namespace boost serialize is all that I need. And that will allow me to write an output archive and read uh, an input archive. I guess, strictly speaking, I could I could scope this down in here since nobody outside that is using it, just to make it clear. Now, for my version 2, so let's collapse this and this, and now let's look at version 2. So for version 2, I, <coughs> I now have two different class types that I need to serialize. I need to serialize the person and I need to serialize the comic. Now for the person, I don't need to do anything special whether I'm reading or writing so I can use the serialize for the person uh, structure. For the comic structure, I want to do something different when I load. So I've, I've done the split function version of that. I've got a save function here which just I could have used the operator ampersand here, but I thought it was more clear when writing a save function to use the insertion operator. And remember these members here, they're now, you know, it's a person pointer and a person pointer is a shared pointer to a person struct. So when I'm writing this save function, it is remembering which shared pointers it has already written and it won't write them more than once because they're shared. Um, so 
the load is where things get a little more interesting. So here's the load function and it's taking the version and I'm gonna switch on the version and if it's a, a version 1 load I'm gonna call one function and if it's a ver version 2 load I'm gonna call the other function. The version 2 load is really straightforward just looks like exactly you would expect. I am just extracting all my data fields one after another and you have to make sure that we're extracting them in the same order that we saved them otherwise we're gonna have problems. <clears throat> now the load the version 1 this is where things get a little more interesting. What I'm going to do is create an instance of my version 1 structure, call the serialize function that I've already written for the version 1, and here I'm going to explicitly pass in 1 as the version to that serializer. That will do the load using the code that I've already written up here. If we go back, so it's going to use this function doing a load explicitly on version 1 and then I'd already written a little upgrade function that takes the version 1 and upgrades it to a version 2 so I can just call that here. Now I could have read the version 1 members into individual variables you know such as this you know just declaring local variables and reading those fields in and I could have um, called a function that would give me the appropriate person pointer, shared pointer for the um, individual fields. But it, it turns out I already needed this little upgrade function because I, I kind of cheated that my, my version 2 load calls the version 1 load and then walks over all the version 1 instances and upgrades them to version 2 instances. So this way this code got reused twice where I, you know this is kind of just example code where I'm just loading my uh, version 1 instances you know once by JSON and another time by just explicit assignment. So since I already had that little upgrade function that I wrote for my version 2 loader I just reused it here. Now, having done all of that, uh, I did a little experiment here where I, I load my version 1 instance database, I write it to an output archive, I make sure that I, uh, sorry, this is my version 2 database, load my version 2 database, write it to an archive, forget all the shared pointers that I created for persons uh, while I was loading and creating those comic instances. Then read it back from the archive. Again, forget everybody that was created when uh, rereading that archive. Then, wow, it's raining hard outside. Um, then I'm going to read uh, an, an old archive, a version 1 archive. So if we look back up here, I collapsed it. Um, let's go down to the bottom. So I'm, I'm doing all the version 1 serialization stuff and then I'm doing all the version 2 serialization stuff. In my version 1 serialization, I loaded the version 1 database, wrote it to an output archive, made sure that I could read that archive back, but now this archive of version 1 comics is on disk. So in my version 2 test code, I load my version 2 instances of the comics, save them to an archive, read them back. But the version 1 archive exists on disk now, and I can open the version 1 archive and read that into a version 2 vector of comics. I can save that back out as an upgraded database and in the end this upgraded database should be the same as this archive 2 that was written out. Now um, 
we can run through this. If I, would, I, I changed the code a little, so let's just build it. And we can run it. There's nothing interesting appearing in the console output, so I'm just going to leave that window off screen. It's just a simple console application. We can come in here. You can see I'm going to load my database. And let's do this. Let's bring over a window so we can see some stuff. So here's my database that was loaded. It's got two issues in it. And this is the version 1 database, so these strings are repeated. They're duplicated. They're not shared pointers to strings yet. I've read that into memory. And now I'm going to open an output archive. I'm going to write that out. And now that file exists on disk, I can... This is an empty database now. It has capacity 0, size 0. It has no instances of any comics in it. Open an archive. Read that archive. Now it has two entries in there, and they're the same as what we wrote out. And again, this is the version 1, so these strings are not deduplicated. They're copied, or duplicated, rather, since they're not deduplicated. So that was the version 1. And now if we look at version 2, now this is my version 2 database. It still has two instances of a comic structure in here. But now you see that the names that are the same are referencing the same shared pointer. The reason there are three strong references is because there's one reference from this record, one reference from this record, and my little database of people that's a vector of shared point or it's, sorry it's a map of name to person pointer right that's the third reference so everybody that gets looked up has at least two references because there's one in that little map and there's one in the associated credit so this credit which is not duplicated between these two issues the name is not duplicated that is it only has two strong references as opposed to three because this is one this is two, and then the third is in my little static map of name to person pointers. So I've created this in memory. I'm creating an output archive, uh, or an output file stream. Uh, creating an output archive, writing everything to that archive. And now when I say forget everything, you notice all these reference counts decreased by one because they're no longer referenced by that global map. And then when I make the database go out of scope, there's no references to any of them, and they all get cleaned up. So now I can create an input file stream on the archive file that we just wrote, and then create an input archive associated with that file stream, deserialize everything back into this new DB member, and we see that everything is as it was before. The shared credits have three strong references. The isolated credits have two strong references. I can forget the people on my uh, global map again. Hey, that didn't go down. It should have gone down. What did I do? I do to clear. Should have nuked everything. I'm not sure where the reference count didn't go down, but um, and it appears I pressed F5 instead of F10. So it went over here. It loaded that in memory, wrote it out to an archive, read it back in from the archive. Everything looked good. We saw that. Then it, uh, let's run it again to here. Control, control F10. So now this is my upgraded database. I'm going to be reading the old version of my comic instances and upgrading them. So we can see how that works by putting a breakpoint here. And 
set up my archive and then I'm reading and you can see that now it's requesting that I read version 1 and my current version is 2 so we're going to say oh we need to upgrade an instance so we're going to load v1 and that works by using our existing code for the serializer on the version 1 it reads all the fields now I have them as a local variable this old variable where these are just plain strings they're not shared I'm going to upgrade that and now this comic that I've deserialized it now has shared pointer strong references this is the first instance of a comic structure that we've read so all the references are two one in the global map and one for each of these fields and that's what upgrading looks like we've upgraded now from version 1 to version 2 and I'm going to remove this break point now I haven't shown you this yet but the stack is pretty deep for all this stuff and you might say wow that's a lot of overhead but in reality there's very little of this code that isn't going to essentially disappear because it's using type delegation uh, yes Daryl um, I think it can. Um, so it's possible. Now this is a this is a debug build, right? If I if I compile this with optimization uh, cranked up, it's going to inline a lot of these functions. Like let's just take a look at some of these functions so we can see what I'm talking about. So this is uh, this is my code. We're in my load function uh, that I've put in namespace boost serialization. But this function here, freeloader, what is it doing? Well, it's constructing like this little local variable and then delegating to load. This is doing argument dependent lookup mechanisms. And the next level up, uh, oh, it's down here. Uh, all it's doing is creating a type def and then invoking um, a function on the type that it computed you know where it's doing a eval if it's trying to figure out if it's doing uh, because this is the split function form it's going to figure out if the archive is a is a write archive or a read archive and if it's a read archive it's going to call the loader function and if it's a write archive it's going to call the saver function so a lot of this is delegating template machinery that once you compile optimized it's just going to compile away to nothing but this is a debug build so everything is visible now um, your point is well taken that not all of it's going to disappear you see that there's two functions down here that um, although I've got the source code for them um, they're fairly lengthy and if you notice carefully you'll see that this is coming from boost underscore seriali serialization dash vc 143 mt gd s64 one underscore 78 dll that is the way that the boost build system encodes the particular flavor of build that I've expressed into a DLL file name. Now, I'm using VC package to obtain boost serialization, which honestly is the easiest way to obtain boost libraries these days. Uh, I haven't talked about that. Let's just show you what that looks like real quick. So all I said was I depend on boost serialization and I also depend on rapid JSON because I still got that JSON code in here from our previous examples. I'm using it to load my database from fixed examples. I had one that was creating an instance from a JSON string. So I'm using rapid JSON for that. But for the purposes of everything we're looking at today, I'm using boost serialization. Now, boost serialization as a library Uh, it's not a good example. Let's go. Okay, so boost serialization as a library tends to depend on other boost libraries like boost config, uh, integer traits, 
uh, anything that says boost slash serialization or boost slash archive, that's all coming from boost serialization. But it does depend on other libraries in boost. So by using VC package, I get all those dependencies, dependencies transitively, and I get the benefit that the part of the serialization library that really prefers to be a compiled piece of code as opposed to a template function in a header, so a source file, um, like this code over here, you notice this is a basic archive, basic i archive.cpp. This is a source file, it's not a header file. So there is a little bit that gets compiled. The rest of all this stuff is small template delegating functions that usually do some kind of um, type computation or some simple expression and then it's just you know two lines of code so a lot of that stuff is going to compile away however getting back to your question about what does that mean for a deeply nested relationship of classes it does imply that when serializing the stack is expected to grow proportionally to the nesting relationship of the classes. So if class A includes an instance of class B, and class B includes an instance of class C, and class C includes an instance of class D, that's a nesting level of four. So I, would, I should expect that even in an optimized build, my stack is going to be four times, my stack requirement is going to be four times as deep as something that is just a, a class containing primitive data types like int and std string. Uh, does that get at your question, Daryl? Okay. Um, so I did want to just show you this stack frame and just warn you not to be scared of it because if you look at a lot of these things, they're doing some little templating stuff and delegating and it's all inline in headers and so when you compile with optimizations turned on, I would expect a lot of this stuff just compiles away completely, especially stuff that's just saying, oh, for purposes of code duplication, I've got things templatized on both input and output archives, and really you're only using one at a time. So it, we didn't want to copy and paste the function twice because it's the same whether you're doing an input archive or an output archive. So there's a little bit of template metaprogramming in there to select the appropriate type and to select the appropriate uh, delegating function for the next layer down. Um, so getting back to where we were in our code, this is just reading that upgrading archive will step out to completion for all these functions. And you can see there, the majority, of, except for the ones that were in those uh, source files, the ones that are in the header files, they're all like little one or two liners that are doing something. Here's, uh, we're almost back out. Okay, so now we're back into my code. So that was all the stuff, the machinery that's involved in reading an input archive. And now we've got our upgraded database in memory. So these are our version two of our comic book instance structure and they're now all using shared pointers. And you can see the reference counts are three and two like we saw before. So now I can write out this upgraded archive. And that's the end of my little code here. And if we go over and look and here's where those files were written. So if we just want to see what these look like, I'm using the text archive. Notice everything is just all on one giant wide line. So here's some metadata about, uh, I'm not exactly sure how much is the metadata about the file archive version and how much of it is metadata about saying this is an instance of the comic class. But here you can see 18. This is the count to the number of characters in the title string. And then here's the issue number, that's a 1. And then 8 is the number of characters in the uh, writer credit, followed by 10, which is the number of characters in the penciler credit, and so on, and it just continues. And notice there's no begin or end markers here in this plain text archive format, so it's uh, 
low overhead except for this little bit of metadata at the front um, there's not you know there's no metadata here indicating that we're on to the next instance of the comic class and that's because up here is metadata indicating we're doing a collection and there's two things in the collection there's two instances of that comic class um, I, I think this one might be the version number or it might this might be like the version number of the collection and then this is the ver might be the version number of the uh, instances that are in the collection um, but we can see if we skip down here here's where the second issue begins and at the end of the data associated with that second instance there's no more there's no more data in the file there's a trailing new line but yeah so what if we look at um, the archive 2 this is the version 2 archive bunch of things look similar um, there's some twos up here <coughs> but some of the things that were ones if we compare this if we can do this so we can have them side by side so here there's some things that are twos that were ones down here now this is just for educational purposes right normally you don't care about the details of this file format if you cared about the details of the archive format you would write your own archive class that models the concepts for archive uh, input archives and output archives uh, and use the serialization framework in conjunction with your own archive class and that would be your own archive class instead of text i archive or xml i archive etc but here we can see that um, okay there was this uh, title and issue that looks the same but now things look a little bit different there's these uh, ones and threes and ones showing in and we see here that here's the uh, the person record for the script writer here's the person record for the uh, penciler here's the person record for the inker here's the person record for the letterer and here's the person record for the colorist and then on the next issue none of that stuff is repeated but there's a new person record for the one credit that was different between the two issues I can't remember if it was the colorist or the uh, letterer so this is much more compact because of the shared pointers and it it's correctly serialized and deserialized everything uh, as we went in and out uh, so this one while the the original version one archive format while it's more explicit we can see directly all the data that's associated with e each instance that was serialized it's also got a lot of duplication in it so if we were serializing millions of records obviously this would be wasting a lot of space uh, this representation is more compact uh, so things are looking good there in terms of storage for lots of records now another thing that I said is we read in the version 1 archive into a version 2 database and then we wrote out the version 2 database so this database and this upgraded one should be identical and they are they are binary equivalent so we successfully upgraded our version 1 instances to version 2 instances and we didn't lose or mix up any data in that process and that's um, pretty much everything that I've got to show you we can go back and there's more details in here in the documentation we only looked at the uh, tutorial here but the reference if you wanted to implement your own archive format you would implement a class that implements either the saving archive concept or the loading archive concept or both so that you could plug in your archiver into the serialization mechanism so remember that was one of the design goals of this class is that serialization 
and the archive format should be orthogonal. So I can mix and match the serialization code that I've written with any archive class that is compatible with the concepts used by the library. Now, there's we, we didn't go into it, but to support XML where the fields in your class correspond to tags in XML. So you have to provide the library with a name for the tag. And uh, oh, it just happens to be on screen right now. But that's what this boost serialization MVP. MVP stands for name value pair. And um, that's so that the library can get the name to write a tag, serialize the data value, which may involve more nested tags if it's an instance of another class as opposed to just a, a primitive type like an int, and then the closing tag. So um, in the case where your variable name is not necessarily the same as your desired tag name, you can supply the tag and the, the variable explicitly but if they end up being the same, you can just use this macro boost serialization MVP that just takes your the supplied argument and, and string ices it, right? And just supplies it as the other argument there. Um, when you end up using XML in this form, you'll notice that the version number associated with your classes is uh, appearing in the XML as a version attribute on the tag that corresponds to your class instance. So um, XML is kind of a pain to be honest. Um, at least here if you need to support XML you can use the XML archive formats that are implemented in the serialization library and it's real to unless you have some kind of really crazy XML requirements it should be sufficient um, it would be interesting if somebody implemented a YAML archive that you could drop into boost serialization a YAML being another common uh, text format encoding that is compact um, and easy to read and easy to hand edit um, it, it there's no um, built-in JSON support because again this library is 20 years old so it's before the popularity of JSON but the general recommendation is if you need JSON serialization just use one of the existing JSON libraries like rapid JSON it does have the downside if you do rapid JSON or some other JSON library that does have the downside that it's up to you to traverse the relationships of your class hierarchy in terms of the way the class instances are referenced inside each other and it's up to you to do things like resolve shared strings um, so that they're only written once if that's a thing you want to support obviously with JSON you could just write out um, shared strings as regular strings um, there's, I, th I think, applying the smarts of boost serialization to a JSON style framework, um, there may be support for that in some existing JSON libraries. I've only used JSON libraries in this very simplistic way here of just uh, storing the plain old data and not worrying about the class hierarchies. But I can't imagine that uh, they haven't considered that. So there's probably support in uh, for deep uh, serialization with deduplication of data inside some existing JSON frameworks. That may be a topic for a, a future talk. But that's pretty much all we've got to say about boost serialization. Um, is there any questions or comments about that before we wrap up? Okay, if not, then we will wrap it up there.